So um, welcome everybody, and um, we're always excited every demo day to be able to talk to uh, some of the top VCs in the area and hear uh, what they are working on, what they're investing in, and what they're seeing out there in the markets. So um, I'm actually going to start um, with on the end there uh, with Sumit, who you just ho heard from from uh, uh, a cipher, but he's a distinguished graduate of uh, IIT uh, Kar Karshapur <laughs> in Insead, exactly, um, and his journey began in investment banking at JP Morgan, uh, where he worked and uh, started his career in the tech sector. And so now he's with um, Cypher Capital as their investment director. And then next uh, to his right, I'm absolutely thrilled to uh, uh, have Sonia Weimuller. Uh, Weimuller, thank you. Co-founder and general partner of VentureSuit. And she, she is um, a MENA-based venture capital fund. Uh, with a global portfolio and focusing on fintech and climate tech. Uh, she herself has held positions at uh, Viacom and Microsoft, um, as well as in, uh, in London, right? That's where, and what I'm expressly, extremely excited about is that she is a jury member of the Cartier Women's Initiative that really helps out uh, women founders and women uh, entrepreneurs. So uh, I encourage everyone to check that one out. Um, and then finally, I'd like to welcome back Oscar Ramos, Managing General Partner at Orbit Startups. Um, Oscar calls himself a full stack, uh, full stack VC, right? So he's done everything from strategy to engineering. So um, advises companies and works with our companies all across the board. And we're excited to have him back. Okay, so I'm actually going to start off here, um, and I just want to hear a little bit about uh, what it is you are seeing right now uh, in the industry for 2024. What are you seeing um, as uh, the the trends? So I want to start over there at the end then. Yeah. Cool. I think I'll, uh, my focus will be slightly narrower than uh, Oscar and uh, Sonia. Uh, it's, it will be more about uh, Web3 itself. So I'll try to focus and, you know, uh, focus my conversation and my uh, talk towards Web3 itself. Uh, I think in, in Web3, what we are seeing right now is uh, like what we believe is infra is at a place where we can see interesting startups, interesting apps, consumer play coming out of there. So definitely one area of uh, sector of, of focus for us has become consumer, which includes everything from a gaming studio towards a social fi app or an entertainment piece as well we recently deployed into two companies which are very close to uh, me personally one is called uh, vera browser which is like a web3 browser focus uh, for market in india they are focused on micro rewards and adding web3 elements they are still trying to figure out what how to do it regulatory kind of you know uh, in, in a regulatory friendly way given that they are in india so that, that's one uh, uh, sector for us. Other one is on the gaming side. So on the gaming side, I think we're, we're, uh, a lot of interesting things are happening. Gaming model in 2017 20, to 2021 was about uh, play to earn, which was only in blockchain. And now we are seeing like very high quality games uh, being built top of, on top of blockchain. So a lot of good games are coming out there, which are fun to play. One of them is sitting right here as Vincent uh, NFT Craft. And um, uh, yeah, seeing a lot of excitement on that side also. Now, beyond the consumer side, uh, I think one thesis we are closely looking at is the BTC ecosystem. So uh, Bitcoin as an ecosystem has never earned yield. So that's also evolving. I'm happy to talk about any of them in detail, but I'd like to pass the, pass the mic along. But yeah, these are two sectors of focus for us as of now. Great. Thank you so much. All right, Sonia, what are you seeing out there? Well, I mean, no surprise, we're a thematic VC that focuses on fintech and climate, so guess. But um, is it helpful if I give a little background first on Venture Soup? Because I don't know how many people are actually familiar with it. So Venture Soup, we started our journey in 2013, so 11 years ago. We started off as a syndicate model uh, back then. Um, by us, I mean, we're four founding partners. We all had day jobs. What we noticed back then was there was no ecosystem or barely any ecosystem in 2013. And there were a lot of people like us, like young professionals in their mid to late 20s at the time, who wanted to invest in early stage tech, but didn't have a regional platform to do so. So we started hosting informal events, kind of like this, where we'd invite our friends, invite interesting entrepreneurs, and then they basically presented their, their ideas to, to our friends, and then we just grew into the largest syndicate at the time uh, of angel investors. We deployed about $30 million through that model. Then it kind of made sense as we grew with the ecosystem out to pivot into a VC model. And by then, we'd already made about 100 investments globally. So our USP is that we never only focused on this region. What we were good at is putting our ear to the ground and understanding what are the types of deals that our investors want to see and then source accordingly, which is why we made investments in the US, in Europe, in India, in Asia, et cetera, and in obviously MENA. Um, and so in 2019, we decided to pivot to a thematic VC model. Um, 
Keeping in mind that historically, most of the VCs in the region tend to be more generalist in their approach. It's only very recently that we're starting to see more sector-focused funds. So in 2020, we basically launched the first sector-focused fund, which was FinTech. Um, and this was obviously um, around slash right before COVID. Uh, FinTech made sense for us from a track record standpoint because we'd made so many investments globally in the FinTech sector. We felt like there was a huge gap in this market uh, and there was going to be a huge amount of acceleration, which we ended up seeing actually with COVID, incidentally. So the timing was right at that point. Um, and then we launched FinTech Fund One, which is backed by all the sovereign wealth funds in the region. So PIF, Mubadala, ADQ, and the like, uh, focused on MENA and Pakistan. In parallel, um, I had previously done a stint with Jacqueline Novogratz, who's the founder of Acumen Fund, uh, which is considered one of the first impact investing funds uh, in the world. And she kind of planted the seed in my head. And so I was like, oh, I wonder what impact investing would look like for this region. And so we launched the first impact vehicle with a global mandate to test the waters. It was more of a beta fund. Made 17 investments from Indonesia to Chile. Have our first unicorn in the portfolio. It's tracking really well. Great for all the naysayers who don't think that you can invest in mission-driven founders and make a non-concessory financial return at the same time. And now we're on our subsequent fund, so FinTech Fund 2, and we're launching the first early stage climate-focused fund. Um, so the climate-focused fund, I would say, was maybe a different approach. We'd already made 19 investments in this space over the last couple of years, so it's, it's an area that we had been kind of digging into. Uh, obviously, COP happened, as some of you know, uh, a couple of months ago. That really served to put climate on the map. People didn't really understand climate. Uh, they thought about climate as more infrastructure type deals. They didn't understand what early stage climate looked like. Thankfully, we had those 19 investments that we could point to both in the region and outside the region. And so back to your original question, climate and fintech, there's a reason why we're doing subsequent funds around those themes. But what are you seeing out there in terms of in those sectors? What are you seeing the trends for 2024 then? Within those sectors? Yeah. So I'll speak for, for climate because I lead our climate practice. Um, I would definitely say it's supply chain. Um, is definitely one. I mean, when people ask me which subsector you're most excited about, probably the, the unsexiest one of them all, which is supply chain. Uh, but especially in this region, I feel like we're kind of ideally positioned as a gateway to actually see more companies developing supply chain solutions to address uh, supply chain traceability, transparency, etc. Um, food and ag has always been an area of focus to deal with food insecurity in this region. Um, so I think we'll see more of that as well. Um, and then, um, obviously, there's a lot of talk around carbon markets. ADGM's been talking a lot about that. Saudi's been talking about that as well. So that's kind of an area to watch. Um, those would be the main ones, I would say. Great. And climate fintech, actually. The nexus between climate and fintech. Climate fintech. And then there's, of course, the Web3 angle to it as well, which we're still new to, um, but something that maybe you and I can talk about. Great. All right, Oscar. What are you well, seeing? I'm, just, just, I mean, you know, I'm not going to be very different. I mean, obviously, we have a thesis because we're very excited about, uh, about that thesis. No, but I want to build on this idea on, on these uh, boring and sexy industries. Yeah. I, I think there's actually a massive opportunity with all of these boring, traditional, uh, and sexy industries that are, in, in general, quite inefficient. They're very, very inefficient. And with the access of technology, and, and what I mean access of technology is not that the technology was not there, is that suddenly, uh, people is way more open to, to, to receive that technology and implement it in the organization. Suddenly, technology is not scary because they get to see, like, just playing with, uh, with, with ChatGPT and, uh, and some of the other tools. And they say, hey, this is actually really cool. And what if I actually go and use this for, uh, for my business? So I think that's a very good opportunity because uh, from an um, from economic point of view right now, there's a lot of uh, interest in, okay, we need to become more efficient. We need to streamline operations. We need to get more with less. And that's one of the powers that technology uh, can achieve. So that's that's by far, that's one of the areas where I'm very, very, very excited. Then particularly on our side, we are, I mean, we are mostly investing in emerging markets. Sometimes there's, there's limited coverage in the media, no? Like many companies in emerging markets, they again might not be the sexiest because they don't allow you to create videos of a rabbit that is looking at a window and doing funny things. You cannot do these type of things. But those are companies that create a massive change. And they, those are companies that in most cases they operate in an absolutely blue ocean without very, very, with a lot of competition and with massive markets where you, when you are able to make something work and you're able to make the economics uh, like positive and, uh, and, and something can, uh, can have an impact in terms of changing whatever you're trying to achieve with this, with this company, there's massive growth opportunity. There's a huge opportunity there. It's today an untapped market. It's, uh, it's a, 
and a part of the world where I believe sometimes entrepreneurship is very, very pure from the point of view of, of the fact that you need to actually do things but being very creative, not really follow trends, not really listen just what the media is saying. You need to be able to to sometimes learn from the Silicon Valley playbook, but but leverage that that emerging market playbook. And and it's surprising. I mean it's surprising for us how we see companies from Argentina becoming global leaders operating across the whole world, companies from, from Pakistan, from India, from Indonesia, and well hopefully soon we'll also have companies from the GTC doing the same. No, we have a we share a couple of companies today and I think this is something that's gonna happen. Okay, great. So one of the things I'm gonna pivot away from talking about trends and things like that. I wanna hear a little bit about um, how you guys are working with your portfolio companies because we all know right now that you know venture capital has hit a slowdown in the last year or so and that's affected funding and so on and so forth and so you know our responsibilities in working with our portfolio companies to continue to support them and keep them successful but I'd like to hear a little bit about um, what you've experienced and where you sort of uh, put some sort of strategic perhaps pivoting maybe um, into helping them. So I'd love to hear actually from Sonia about your portfolio. Yeah. Um, so obviously these are hard times. I mean, we're fundraising right now and I think entrepreneurs tend to forget that we as fund managers also have to fundraise um, in order to get money to them. Um, so uh, fundraising is definitely one area that uh, that most of us kind of roll up our sleeves um, and, 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 and support, whether it be from a fundraising kind of materials preparation standpoint or mainly introductions to widen kind of the, the investor base. They might be looking to only go to the same usual suspects. For example, in the region, we can help them think outside the box. In our case, because we've invested internationally, really our um, kind of our, not secret sauce, but like the area that I enjoy the most and that we do well, I think, is actually working with companies from abroad and bringing them here, um, especially for climate. So we have one company, for example, called Dendra. They're doing all the mangrove restoration work uh, on the coasts um, using drones and their AI platform. We seeded them in 2018, pun intended, because their drones shoot out seeds. Um, and we co-invested with Parrot, the drone manufacturer. And you know, I had been evangelizing, come to the region, come to the region. And they were based in Australia and the UK. And they're like, no, 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 no. We're going to stick to Europe, or like maybe we'll go to the US, etc. And then fast forward five years later, they started thinking about the region. And they just launched, uh, opened their office last year in Abu Dhabi. Now they're doing all this government work. And it's a multi-year very big contract for them, and that's kind of opened up their eyes now. They just got a funding round, they got money from Aramco, they're gonna to go to Saudi next, etc. So all that is kind of possible because we're the only ones from the region on their cap table that help facilitate that. So I would say fundraising and then scaling based on our own networks. Uh, people forget that this game only works with the founders, and we are here in service to the founders. They, that is our role. Everyone always kind of focuses on the fund managers and the VCs, etc. None of this works without the founders. And we are here as allies to the founders. And so oftentimes for the founders who are in the room, uh, if you have fundraised and you have investors on your cap table, use them, leverage them. They are all incentivized to see you succeed. So see them as extensions of your team with whichever aspect of your work you need help on, whether it be fundraising, whether it be scaling, whether it be strategic advice, even whether it be personal advice, to be honest, right? And so, um, so I think that that's kind of a, a, a takeaway I would say for the founders is just don't forget that we are here for you. We're not here against you. Thank you so much. And how about Cypher? What is Cypher doing to portfolio yeah, actually, management? You know, and, uh, yeah. About the same, I think, helping, helping them with fundraising a lot because last year, last two years were very difficult for a lot of Web3 companies as well. So kind of to uh, figure out a way, okay, how you can be innovative in raising funds. If the market is not doing well, maybe just go out and talk to your community. Maybe they, that could help you because NFT is all about community. So a lot of companies actually launched their NFT protocols, NFT uh, uh, NFTs, and they were able to raise some capital out of it. And another thing that we are seeing, which is a common theme right now, is a lot of companies want to move to MENA. Because uh, MENA is the only place in the region which is open to Web3. India is closing off, you see Singapore taking a U-turn. Hong Kong has now kind of opened up. Uh, it's only like last six months. But MENA is like, there's Ragdao, there is uh, Vara, there is ADGM, everyone fighting with each other, which is rare to see in any, uh, any other geographies. So I think that's one help that we are providing them beyond fundraising. And I think one more thing is more about talking to each other also. Because a lot of uh, 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 PCs, founders kind of don't ask, okay, who can I talk to? So we have to be proactive, okay, you know, you are building a gaming infra, 
this is the gaming list that we have, go talk to them. And I agree that founders tend to kind of, you know, not ask for help. They should ask more, okay, what can I do more? And yeah, that has been the feedback and that has been the journey for us, what we are seeing. Can I just add to that? Because I think yeah. it is that dicey relationship between investor and founder, right? As a founder, how open are you going to open that kimono, right? Because on the one hand, like, you're always going to need to fundraise from Sumit and Sonia or Oscar, right? So, like, how open do you want to be with that with your investors? And I think it's really important for the investors, I see a lot of investor tags here, um, to create that safe space for the founders as well, for them to feel comfortable actually talking to you about some of the challenges that they're facing. Because ultimately, if you find out about these challenges later on, it's too late. Um, so, so that's advice to both the founders and the investors, actually. Investors create that safe space so that people actually, so that you're approachable. And then founders, like, don't be afraid to open up the kimono. And maybe you're strategic in who you approach from your cap table. You don't have to open your kimono to everyone. But maybe identify those two or three investors who maybe you vibe well with, who you think will be understanding and be helpful to you. Julie, you know, I wanted to share something a bit different. We were talking, oh, we help fundraise, we help with, uh, with, uh, with uh, sales, et cetera. It's like, and we shared something earlier, and it's like, let's say something different. And this is something I wanted to share, no? At the end of the day, there's, there's an asymmetry between investors and, and funders, and is that investors are seen way more than many funders. Some funders are able to see really deep on their company, maybe they are close friends, they might be able to see something else, but most of the investors are seen many things. No? So I think one of the areas where a lot of investors can help is help give a guidance and visibility on the market with information that is normally not, not available. I mean, in our case, we're working with over 200 companies. And, uh, and we have a lot of primary data on what's working, what's not working, what are the trends. And right now, in relation to this idea of sharing with your investors, this is a moment where investment decisions are taking way, way longer. And they're taking longer because investors are really looking if you change your underwear every day or not. So they're checking everything. And if, if there's something there, they're going to find out. So the best, the best partner that you can have to start finding like how to handle that, because that something is not perfect in a startup is a given. You are a startup. It's not perfect. So something is, needs to be, need to be fixed. The real problem is either when you are hiding it or, or, or that you even don't know that you have a problem. So acknowledging and, and saying, hey, something here is not as good as I expected is recognizing that you're able to identify the problem, define that this is something that needs to be fixed, and then start working on, uh, on fixing it. So I think one of the areas that, uh, that, um, that we've been working a lot with the companies uh, is trying to build that trust. Build a trust with existing investors, creating the right forums, understanding how to communicate more, eff more effectively, being open on, uh, on some of the challenges, leveraging that network to, to support, and then hopefully that trust being something that you can extend to prospective investors and, and say, look, if we want to start working together and we want to receive your investment, this is the way we work with our investors, this is the way we want to work with you, and this is the way we want to work because we need to be uh, partners together. So I think this is a very important element, no? like as, as investors help to, to understand how funders, how to handle those investor relations with existing and future, and future investors. And, and, and particularly right now, very important because there's many paths that they seem to go into the right direction and you see that you have progress, but they lead to a de dead end. And, uh, and that's unfortunately right now something that, uh, that you have less opportunities because there's less funding available that will allow you to have a plan B. So you need to try to use as much as you can to figure out, I mean, decide as soon, find out as soon as possible that you're working and walking in the right direction. All right, well, thank you very much. Unfortunately, it's all we have time for, but I'm hearing a lot about working together with your cap table. Uh, reaching out, transparency, both both sides. Takes two to tango, as we say, so there needs to be a safe space created by investors, and then um, startup companies need also to approach this with a feeling of uh, transparency and openness. All right, well, I want to thank Sumit and Sonia and Oscar. Thank you so much for your insights today. Everybody, let's give them a big round of applause. Thank you very much.